Everybody, I'm a little hot, so <laughs> not me personally, but the mic. How's everybody doing tonight? Good. I am Pastor Terry. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Crossley. Um, Pastor Matthew uh, wanted me to convey to you that he really wishes he could be here tonight because he's been really enjoying um, Pastor Richard's uh, messages and um, the teaching that he's been giving us. I've really enjoyed what we're learning, and um, it reminds me of my seminary days. <laughs> and uh, so, um, so you guys are, are in for it tonight, and I uh, hope you guys are tagging right along with us here. Um, I have some of these cards in my hand. They are also at the table in the back. If you have questions as we're going throughout the evening tonight, um, you can either write them down, or if you have my phone number, some of you might, you can text them to me. That would be fine. And, um, and then at the intermission, I will collect those cards, and then at the end um, tonight, we will take a few minutes to answer some of your questions. So um, if you don't have a card, you can, I can give you one. Just raise your hand and let me know when, I, when we get done praying. Um, or you can grab one from the back over there, and uh, then turn those in at intermission. I'll come back and ask for them, so we'll be, we'll be in good shape there. Um, I feel like there was one other thing I was supposed to tell you. Um, it'll come to me eventually. All right. Thank you guys for being here this evening. Thank you, Richard, um, for hosting these events. And uh, let's begin with a word of prayer, and then uh, I'll turn it over to uh, him. Father, I thank you for this day. And uh, God, I thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here. And uh, God, to learn uh, from you and uh, from your word and from uh, your uh, teaching to us, Father. I pray that you would... Uh, help us tonight. Help us to understand uh, where all of this is going. And uh, Father, help us to know that we can trust you and trust the plan that you have for our lives and uh, for our future. And uh, so God, we do uh, look forward with anticipation to the return of your son, Jesus. And uh, God, we uh, know that um, you are moving time and history and all of these things according to your will and your purpose. And so, Father, help us tonight to understand, uh, give us wisdom by your Spirit, and uh, we'll give you the glory for all that you do. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Well, good evening. Well, you all have been faithful to this class, I must say. I mean, each week you're uh, the same group of about 80 people is back, and that's encouraging to me. My wife said after the first uh, night, she said, what are you going to do if we get, get there tonight? This is last week, and there's only about 10 people. <laughs> so, well, <that's, laughs> this can be discouraging. But uh, you all have been really super faithful, I must, I must say, and that is a, a great encouragement. I just, I just trust that some of what we've been sharing with you in these weeks on Bible prophecy has been an encouragement to your heart and has uh, really caused you to think more seriously and <clears throat> perhaps a little deeper uh, in respect to the future, future events. And uh, that's the goal of this uh, class. We have some special guests here tonight from Charlotte, North Carolina. My sister drove up today from Charlotte and uh, she's here, she's back there by my wife, Nancy, and my mother is here. This October, mom turned 94. <laughs> she's holding out for the rapture. <laughs> What can I say? Yeah, that's exciting. And mom, of course, uh, spent her whole life as a pastor's wife. My father was a pastor in upstate New York uh, for his whole life. And so my mom, bless her heart, knows what it means to be a pastor's wife. So we are glad, Elaine and mom, really glad to have both of you here uh, with us this evening. 2 Samuel chapter 7 is our first text, and I'm looking at the first of the three pages that you have. It's the one that's entitled, God's Covenant Promise to Israel that has yet to be fulfilled. 
God's covenant promise to Israel that has yet to be fulfilled. Most of you know that King David really wanted to build a temple, a house for the Lord. But God says, no, you're not going to do that. Uh, you served your purpose in making Israel the great kingdom that it is. You've subdued all the enemies. Uh, you are the warrior king. But your son, who's coming after you, he's going to be known for the peace. You fought all the battles, you've won all the battles, and uh, but it's going to be your son who's going to have a reign of uh, peace, and he's the one that's going to build the temple. Let me read uh, the passage for you, starting in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. And when your days are fulfilled, God is speaking to David, and you sleep with your fathers. I will set up your seed after you that will proceed out of your bowels, and I will establish his kingdom at Solomon. He will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. <coughs> Down in verse 16, and your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. The throne shall be established forever. Now, we, we know that the first part of that prophecy applies to Solomon because he's the one that built Solomon's temple. And so God says, look, you're not going to build the temple. Your son is going to build the temple. But then the whole Davidic covenant goes on to talk about this kingdom that's going to last forever. Well, first of all, Solomon didn't last forever. He was human. He died. And the kingdom actually lasted, that was about 1000 B.C. It lasted until 606 B.C. And the last king of Israel was Zedekiah, the last of the kings of Judah. And the kingdom of Israel stopped at that point. There was no king of Israel after 606 B.C. So in what sense could God's covenant to David be true? How in the world can it be said, okay, David, you're not going to build a temple. Your son is, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. As a matter of fact, the word forever is used three times in this covenant. Now, the answer to that dilemma is quite easy to understand. God is moving from Solomon to the one who, in Matthew, is called the greater than Solomon. And that's none other than the Lord Jesus. You see, in order to have an eternal kingdom, you have to have an eternal person. It takes someone who is eternal to have an eternal kingdom. Does that make sense? Because all human people die. They don't last forever. No matter how powerful they are, no matter how extensive their kingdom is, they're human, they're going to die. So this covenant to David is, is a prophecy about Christ, another son of David, not Solomon, another son of King David, is going to be the one who establishes the throne of David forever. So, looking at your notes here, letter A, first he promised a son that would build the house of the Lord, that's Solomon, we know. Second, letter B, second he promised another son of David who would have an eternal kingdom. Only an eternal king can have an eternal kingdom. And uh, I quote here the Davidic covenant. Now, we move then from 2 Samuel 7, which is the God's covenant with King David. We move then to the great, I call it the Christmas prophecy of Isaiah 9. I notice that all the department stores are already decorating for Christmas now. Do you notice that? It seems like Christmas comes earlier and earlier every year. So uh, our minds kind of go to this passage of Scripture at Christmas time. Um, I call it the Christmas prophecy. It's Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. 
That was fulfilled by Christ at Bethlehem. Okay? But the last part of that, and all of verse 7, has yet to be fulfilled. The part that says, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. That hasn't happened yet. Christ was born. He was the son that was born, the, the child that was born, the son that was given. But that phrase, the government will be upon his shoulder. And then verse 7 says, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be, listen to this, no end. Oh, there's that phrase again. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, now watch what's happening. Isaiah now is quoting what? The Davidic covenant of 2 Samuel 7. Upon the throne of David to order an establishment, establish it henceforth even forever. So the great Christmas prophecy of Isaiah 9 actually has more to do with the second coming of Jesus than even the first coming of Jesus. Did you ever think about that? The, the, the tremendous prophecy of Isaiah 9 is all about this one who would reign on the throne of David forever. Now that moves me up to point number three. The angel that appeared to Mary reminds Mary of God's covenant promise to Israel. Remember Mary? She said, I don't know how this is going to happen. And the angel explains to her the miracle of the virgin birth. And then the angel goes on in Luke chapter 1. And I want to read it right from the Bible. Luke chapter 1. The angel is speaking to uh, Mary here and says this. Verse 32. page. Try chapter 1 verse 32. Here it is. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. Now listen to this. Listen to what the angel says to Mary. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Does that sound like Isaiah 9, 6, and 7? And does that sound like 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 16? It sure does. It all goes together. So what am I saying? I'm saying that all of this covenant promise that God gave to David, and then Isaiah quotes it, and then the angel quotes it in talking to Mary about this person that's going to be born from her womb. And even the angel says, he's going to rule over the house of Jacob forever. Can you begin to understand why the disciples had a hard time accepting the death of Jesus? Because the disciples were not looking for a suffering savior who would die on a cross. They were looking for a king of Israel that would take over and displace the government of Rome. They wanted a political salvation more than a spiritual salvation. So all of that, all of that has yet to be fulfilled. It hasn't happened yet. Christ was born as king of the Jews. He died as king of the Jews. But he has not reigned as king of the Jews. This will take place when he comes back the second time. Now I'm going to go to Revelation chapter 11. Every time I read this verse, I get so excited I can hardly stand it. I feel like jumping up and down and raising my fist in the air. I mean, I, I just can't tell you how excited I am about Revelation 11, 15. It's called the seventh trumpet judgment. And actually, this judgment is more of an announcement than a judgment. <clears throat> Let me read it. 
The seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now many of you recognize that verse because there's been a masterpiece of music written by George Frederick Handel called the Hallelujah Chorus, which is a great a part of the greater uh, musical work, uh, the Messiah. And um, that, the Hallelujah Chorus is Revelation 11, 15. The kingdoms, listen to this announcement. There's going to be a point in time right at the end of the tribulation, when you get right at the very end of the tribulation and the seventh trumpet sounds, this announcement is made. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And I feel like bursting into hallelujah right now. Amen? Amen. I can't wait until Jesus comes back again and all the kingdoms of this world are transferred and become the kingdom of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he will reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. As a matter of fact, when Jesus comes back in the second coming, it says in Revelation 19, I'm at the very bottom of page one here, he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's Revelation 19, 16. Let me give you one more verse. The prophet Zechariah wrote this, The Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord and his name well, thank God that there is coming a time where Jesus will actually reign as king. And again, I say this, you can't have an eternal king kingdom without an eternal king. And that is all fulfilled in the person uh, of our Lord Jesus. We come now to page 2, Lesson 3b, The Most Neglected Truth of Bible Prophecy. Let's take a break. Does anyone have a question right at this point? I won't make you wait till intermission. Any? Okay, let's move on. The Most Neglected Truth, I believe, of Bible Prophecy. There's a great deal of emphasis on the rapture, and we spent one whole evening talking about that. The signs of the times those events at the end of the age that kind of point or set the stage, you know, for the coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ, the tribulation. Next week we'll be talking about the Antichrist a little bit more. So there's a lot of emphasis on all of those things, but little emphasis on and really little understanding of a period of time that will last for a thousand years. Now, it would seem to me that if there's a period of time coming in, in the whole scope of prophecy that's going to last a thousand years, that people would pay more attention to it, you would think, just because of how extensive it is. But I'm finding that a lot of Christians are woefully ignorant and untaught as it relates to the millennial kingdom rule and reign of Christ. So I want to spend the bulk of our time this evening, we want to kind of study that theme a little bit, and uh, you're, you're going to learn some very unique and interesting uh, insights, hopefully, as we move through this material. So let's uh, start here. First, the fact that Christ will one day rule over the earth. And I've quoted several verses here. Let me just read them for you. Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him. Isaiah 40, verse 10. He, the one whose name is Branch, shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne. Zechariah 6, 12. Here's one that you probably uh, will recognize. 
But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Now we always think of that verse in respect to Christmas also because it names prophetically the place of Christ's birth. And even in Matthew chapter 2, where it talk, or Luke chapter 2, where it talks about Mary and Joseph, you know, the taxation from Caesar Augustus, and they had to go to Bethlehem because, why? Because Joseph was of the house and lineage of David. That was his ancestral family, so he had to go to Bethlehem. And you all know the story, the nativity, and that's where Christ ends up being born in fulfillment of Micah 5 2. But the part of that verse that we may have overlooked by emphasizing the place of his birth, which is Bethlehem, is the purpose of his birth, which he is to be ruler over Israel. And again, that did not happen in his first coming, it is going to happen in his second coming. Second, the fact that the reign over this reign over a literal earthly kingdom will last for a thousand years. Three times in Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6, it refers to a thousand years. Let me just read a couple of those verses. They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Another verse says, They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So we know that Christ is the ruler promised. He is going to rule for a thousand years. What else can we learn? Third, the fact that Christ will rule powerfully with a rod of iron. A rod of iron. Revelation 2.27, 12.5, and 19.15 all state exactly how Christ will rule the nations with a rod of iron. I'm not really sure how this, you know, I'm trying to envision this in my mind. I think the rod there speaks of the swiftness and the severity of justice during the kingdom. Now, I don't know if it's a literal rod where people that step out of line, are, you know, they're going to get whacked or what, you know. But... <laughs> The same Jesus who made a homemade whip and overthrew the money changers' temples and, and, and cracked the whip to get the people out of the uh, temple there in, in John chapter 2, when he comes back again, when he rules in perfect justice, uh, it will be swift and severe justice. Let me just say that, okay? Swift and severe um, and then later in Revelation 19, it says, uh, Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he shall smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his vesture a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Revelation 19, verses 15 and 16. Fourth, the fact that we as God's people will also rule and reign with Christ. Here's the point that most of us probably did not ever understand. You say, I understand that Jesus is King. King of kings and Lord of lords. I understand that He is worthy to rule over the earth. That the Davidic covenant and all the promises of God to King David and the prophecy of Isaiah 9 and the announcement of the angel to Mary, all of that has yet to be fulfilled. It hasn't been fulfilled yet. So I understand how Jesus has yet to rule over the earth. But the part that we probably did not understand is the emphasis in Scripture that God's people will be part and participants in that rulership. And let me give you some passages. We shed some light on that. 
Look at the Revelation 20, 4 through 6 passage again. It says, they lived and reigned with Christ. They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Paul wrote this to Timothy. It is a faithful saying, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also, listen to this, reign with him. 2 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. That brings me to the Beatitudes, where Christ talks about how people that were the downtrodden, the meek, the poor in spirit, they're going to end up being the ones in positions of authority. For instance, the meek shall inherit the earth. Think of that. The, the meek shall inherit the earth. And then, probably the best one of all is Revelation 5, 9 and 10. They sung a new song saying, You are worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof, for you were slain and has redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Now, we, we've, we've heard that verse before. Listen to this and have made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Take your pen and underline that. Revelation 5 says Christians will rule and reign on the earth with Christ. We are, the, we are his children. We are his chosen one. By the wonderful miracle of the new birth, we've been born into the family of God. And I'm telling you, when God takes over, he's going to let his children be part of his kingdom, even in the administration of his kingdom. We will be the family of God. And I'm here to tell you, folks, that as part of the family of God, we don't just have heaven someday to look forward to. We have a thousand years of co-regency, if you will, of of participation in the actual administration of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And it's all because of amazing grace. Amen? Amen. It's all because of grace. It's not because we're better than anybody else. It's not because we deserve to be ruling over the earth. We don't deserve to rule over anything. We're just sinners saved by grace. But I want to tell you one of the most neglected parts of Bible prophecy is the truth that not only will Jesus reign on the earth, but we also who belong to Jesus will be part of that rule and reign of Christ. Is that fantastic or what? You said, well, I've never held a position of authority in my life. I never even ran for dog catcher. <laughs> Well, cheer up. If you're a child of God, you'll, you'll have a part in this. <laughs> Let me move on to part five here, fifth. It appears that the extent of responsibility we are given in respect to ruling with Christ depends on how faithful we were to him with what he gave us to do in this life. Boy, I wish I could preach a whole sermon on this. Maybe I'll have to sometime in the future. But you know, you, you have the parable of the talents, which is probably the best single passage on this thing. The guy that was faithful and what he was given was given much. You know, if you're given a little and you handle it well, you're entrusted with more. But the guy that took his talents and what did he do? He went and I think buried them in the earth. Isn't that how it goes? He couldn't be... He couldn't be counted on to properly manage what he was given and so he wasn't given any more responsibility. As a matter of fact, any future responsibility was actually taken away from him and given to somebody else. So what are we saying here? Faithfulness to Christ in this lifetime becomes 
part of what is involved with the extent of our uh, ruling and reigning with Christ. Those who are not faithful in serving Christ will not be given important assignments of administration. Which leads me to this all-important question. Here's the practical application of all of this. Are we the kind of Christian Jesus can depend on when he rules this earth? Are we the kind of Christian that Jesus can count on when he rules over the earth? I sure wish I had more time to develop that last point. If you want an exciting study, dig into that deeply. Go back in the Gospels and read the parable of the talents, particularly, and see how what Jesus is teaching in that parable relates to future responsibilities in his kingdom. Okay, we're doing really good on time. I made it through those first two whole lessons in a little over a half an hour. So what we're going to do now is take a break for about five minutes. If you need to use the restroom, go ahead and do it. You can stand up and stretch. If you're going to talk with one another, make sure you have your mask back on. Uh, if you're close to other people and want to talk to them. Uh, most of all, if you have any questions, Pastor Terry is ready to gather up your written questions. And in about a half hour, right around 7.30, when I finish page three here, we'll entertain some questions before you leave, okay? Let's take a break, all right? Let's get started again, shall we? see a bunch of intelligent questions were uh, turned in. I'm almost dreading question time. <laughs> so let's uh, pick up on uh, the third page of your notes for tonight. The nature and characteristics of the Millennial Kingdom. I just want to kind of give you a flavor for what life will be like on the earth uh, for the thousand years. Uh, by the way, that's another part that's so significant about the kingdom, because we, we think about, okay, there's this life and then there's heaven, okay? And obviously if we die now, a person goes to heaven, that's all true. But in the prophetic future, after the tribulation, you've got this whole thousand year time on earth before you get to the new heaven and new earth and what we call the eternal state. That is our eternal abode in heaven, okay? So you, you got this huge period of time where we're on the earth. So let's learn as much tonight as we can about what life on earth will actually look like and feel like for that thousand years. Uh, there are three reasons why the thousand-year kingdom of Christ is so glorious. This is just basic reasons why it's so good. Number one, because Christ is in complete control of the government. All the governments of the earth, okay? Yeah, I see that struck a note. <laughs> Corruption under Christ. Well, <laughs> Christ will be in complete control of the government. Second, because Satan is bound for a thousand years. Well, that that right there helps explain why the kingdom is so glorious and so wonderful, because our arch enemy, Satan, is bound for that whole thousand year period. And reason number three is that the Holy Spirit is poured out upon all flesh. That's Joel 2.28 and Isaiah 32.15, which I don't have time to, to read both those verses, but there is a tremendous uh, influence of the Holy Spirit during the millennial period. So Christ is ruling as King of Kings, Satan is bound, and the Holy Spirit has greater influence He's poured out on the whole earth. And so those three reasons help us understand why the kingdom period is such a wonderful period of time. 
So how wonderful and glorious is the Millennial Kingdom going to be? What are some of the main characteristics? I've listed 10, and I could this list could go on all night, actually. But let me give you 10 of the more important characteristics. Number one, peace. Peace. Something that this world has been striving for for ages and can never achieve. You know what? You can't have peace on earth until you have the prince of peace in charge of the earth. There is no peace apart from Jesus Christ. It says, and you'll recognize these verses. He shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Isn't that wonderful? Boy, you won't have our military men and women giving their lives anymore. The whole the whole thing of dying in battle. And as a matter of fact, most Bible scholars believe that instead of a military industrial complex like we have in the world today, it's going to be an agrarian lifestyle. We get that from verses like they beat their swords into plowshares. Well, what do you do with a plowshare? You plow. What do you do with a pruning hook? You tend to your vineyard. And you compare that with verses like, every man will abide under his own fig tree. Now that to me, I can see myself on a hammock for a, th <laughs> for a thousand years. <laughs> there is Richard on his hammock for a thousand years under his fig tree. Life doesn't get any better than that, folks. The, the picture there of every man abiding under his own fig tree is, is, is symbolic, I think, of just, it's just going to be so peaceful, so, so unbelievably peaceful. Well, I don't know about you, but I can handle that right now. With the way our world is now, I can handle a, a kingdom of absolute peace on earth. Oh, by the way, wasn't that the promise when Jesus was born? Yeah. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, what? Peace. Okay? Uh, you can't have peace without Christ. That's, that's as simple as it is. Number two, joy. It would be a, just amazing joy. If any of you are struggling with depression tonight, listen carefully. You're going to have a period of a thousand years of sublime, just overwhelming joy. The ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs of everlasting joy on their heads. And they shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Now you read that, that's out of Isaiah too. Uh, you, you read that and you think that's talking about heaven. No, it's not talking about heaven. I mean... It's true of heaven. But that prophecy is not about heaven. It's about the kingdom. Okay? You, you need to understand that. Number three, righteousness. And the nation shall see thy righteousness and all kings thy glory. Isaiah 62, 2. By the way, Isaiah is the, probably has more to say about the millennial kingdom if, if you want to do an in-depth study of the Millennial Kingdom, read through Isaiah and underline all through Isaiah every time there's a reference to the Kingdom period. I mean, I've already given you three or four, and we're, we're not even done with this list yet, okay? It's a lot of it. And then there's Malachi 4, too. You know, Malachi 4 is the last chapter of the Old Testament, and you know what the prophecy of Malachi 4, too? The Son, S-U-N, not S-O-N, the Son of Righteousness will arise with healing in His wings. That's a reference to Christ and the rule of Christ. And what, what's Jesus called there? The Son of Righteousness. Number four, holiness. There's a millennial highway that's going to be built 
through the desert leading up to the throne where Jesus literally reigns. Now, try to picture this in your mind. A literal highway. People will be walking along this highway singing. They're on their way to Zion. They're rejoicing. And the name of this highway, according to scripture, is the way of holiness. It says a highway shall be there in a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness, Isaiah 35, 8. Zechariah 14, 20 talks about the bells on the horses. In the millennial kingdom, even the harness uh, around the horse's neck that holds all the bells is going to be inscribed holiness to the Lord. It says every pot, every clay pot in Jerusalem is going to be inscribed with holiness to the Lord. See, the, the fact is that there is peace, there's joy, there's righteousness, there's holiness. I guess what you could say is this, everything Jesus is will be characteristic of the millennial kingdom. Everything you can say about Jesus is going to be true of this kingdom period. Number five, justice. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, establish it with justice and judgment from henceforth even forever. <coughs> so much injustice in this world right now. So much. And, you know, it's a cause for people to be so upset with with the injustices that we see. Well, I'm, I want to tell you, when Christ rules, there will be perfect justice. Perfect justice. Okay? Number six, instruction. For someone as myself that has devoted my life to teaching the Word of God, this is probably the thing that excites me the most. I mean, I'm looking forward to the joy and the happiness and the peace and the, the righteousness. But here's what I'm really looking forward to. The kingdom reign of Jesus will be an unparalleled time of teaching. Quote, the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, Habakkuk 2.14. Quote, and many people shall go and say, come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. When Jesus was here the first time, he was the master teacher. And we have the whole gospel accounts of all that Jesus taught. Can you imagine what it's going to be like for a thousand years to sit under the direct teaching of Jesus Christ? So many uh, worldly politicians don't do any teaching. They do a lot of things, but teach they don't. When Jesus rules, his rule is going to be characterized by teaching the principles and precepts of the Word of God. Now, to me, that's pretty exciting. I just love that idea. I've often said... One of the things when I see the Lord, after I thank him for saving a wretch like me, I am going to say, would you tell me what your Bible study was with the two, prop, two disciples on the road to Emmaus? Yeah. Because on that Sunday afternoon that Jesus rose from the dead, he walked with them several hours, and the scripture says, Beginning at Moses and through all the prophets, he expounded to them in all things pertaining to himself. And I can just, I can just almost imagine the serpent on the pole. That was me. The blood on the doorpost. That's me. Isaac on Mount Moriah. That was me. The suffering servant of Isaiah 53, that was me. The one who cried out 
as the psalmist did, my God, my God, why hast thou first said, that was me. Abel's little offering of that was accepted as the only way, the only thing that's acceptable to God. The lamb offering that Abel, that was me, the lamb of God. So, yeah, I'm going to have a wonderful time in the millennial kingdom, for sure. Number seven, the removal of the curse from vegetation. Uh, the earth is going to be severely different than the way it is now. I picture the earth more like what the Garden of Eden was, almost like a paradise, a tropical paradise. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, from Scripture. The wilderness and solitary place shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like a rose. The parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. And the habitation of jackals where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. That's Isaiah 35, verses 1 and 7. So removal of the curse from the vegetation. Number 8, removal of the curse from animals. Animal creation will be changed so as to lose its venom and ferocity. Quote, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the goat, and the calf and the young lion together, and a little child shall lead them. <laughs> oh, what a picture that is. A little toddler walking around pulling a lion behind him, like a little puppy dog. That's just phenomenal, isn't it? And then it goes on to say, And the nursing child shall play on the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the viper's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. Isaiah 11, 6 through 9. Number 9, healing. This can be a great ministry of healing during the millennial kingdom. The eyes of the blind shall be opened. The ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart or a deer, and the tongue of the mute shall sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. A great uh, devotional book called, was written with that title, Streams in the Desert. This is my wife's favorite verse. Most of you know she's battling um, adult onset muscular dystrophy. And uh, this is Nancy's verse. The lame will leap like the deer. Isn't that wonderful? That's just tremendous. Number 10, worship. It shall come to pass that everyone that's left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king. This is talking about unsaved. And by the way, two of you ask, are there unsaved people in the kingdom? The answer is yes, everybody that survives the tribulation. There's almost 5 billion people. The last I heard was 4.5 billion people in the earth right now. We know that a lot are killed in the tribulation. There's one judgment. I looked at Revelation 6.4, the, uh, and it says a fourth part of the whole world's population is killed uh, by famines and earthquakes and so forth. Uh, so if you add all the judgments of the tribulation, or, you know, it's probably, there's only probably going to be half the world's population. But the a quick answer is yes. There's the worst, there's going to be a lot of unsaved people that, that survive the tribulation period. Uh, the millennial kingdom is going to be a weird mixture of Christians and glorified bodies. Keep in mind, we, we're not going to have this body, okay? You wouldn't survive the rapture in this body. <laughs> you're you're going to be changed. You're going to have a glorified body. So you're going to have millions and millions of born-again Christians walking around in glorified bodies, but you're also going to have millions and millions of unsaved people who just survive, you know, the tribulation. And they will have human bodies. But even they will be worshiping Jesus. You say, how do you know that? Well, look what it says. Look again. 
It shall come to pass that everyone that's left of all the nations that came up against Jerusalem, that's unsaved people, okay, that's talking about the battle of Armageddon there, shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts. Zechariah 14, 16. And so the whole earth is going to have to pay tribute to Jesus. That kind of ties in, by the way, doesn't it, with uh, Philippians, how does this go, Philippians 2, 11, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, 11. And on the bottom of your sheet, I put, oh, what a glorious day that will be. Okay, 7.30 on the dot. We're going to take 10 minutes for questions or until I'm stumped, <laughs> at which time Perry, Pastor Terry is going to um, answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be comical. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So we've, uh, we've got a few questions here. The first one you've already answered. Um, will there be unsaved people and people being saved, or is it just those of us that are saved in the millennium? There's both. Now that's a good question. Can people be saved during the millennium? Um, we addressed that last week in respect of the tribulation. We know that a lot of people will get saved during the tribulation. There's no indication that I know of that during the kingdom period there will be people being saved, but I can't say that dogmatic. I'm just saying I, I can't think of a scripture to point to right now one way or the other. So then the follow-up to that is will, will they live throughout the thousand years, those who are unsaved or get saved through them? Uh, they are people in their natural bodies uh, that don't have glorified bodies like we will have. I believe they'll have extended lifespan, most Bible teachers, and there's a couple of verses that seem to, um, how's that go, an infant of days of, I can't quote it. Uh, anyway, the gist is that there will be a longevity. There will be a longevity. Remember back before the flood, people lived hundreds of years, okay? There, there was more of a longevity to people's lifespan, and many Bible teachers, and I kind of feel this way too, that just because of the sheer characteristics of the Millennial Kingdom, uh, there's probably longer lifespans. Uh, I think that people will die, though. I, I, don't, I, I don't think we can say there won't be death. I don't see that. Okay? That's my opinion. This one has to do with the sacrifices. Will sacrifices be reinstated during the millennial kingdom? And if so, why? Uh, they are during the tribulation because if Antichrist puts a stop to it there in the temple. Um, I think if Jesus is ruling as king of kings on a throne in Jerusalem over the earth, I don't, I think he will accept sacrifices that are sacrifices of praise. Uh, like the Feast of Tabernacles. As a matter of fact, what verse did I just read there? It's right on your sheet there. They will come up to the, uh, to worship the king and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay. But that is not a blood sacrifice feast, okay? On the basis of all the verses in the book of Hebrews that says that Jesus Christ is the final sacrifice for sin forever, I cannot envision Jesus standing by and having people do animal sacrifices to atone for sin when he's already paid the price for the sins of the world. I cannot uh, see that happen. So, sacrifices of Grain, tithing of grain, uh, uh, oil, all, all the non-blood sacrifices, yes. It's because they're sacrifices of praise to God. Uh, this one has to do with Gog and Magog. Who is Gog and Magog in Revelations 20? And will we be capable of sinning when Satan is loosed at the end of the uh, we won't be 
capable of sinning when Satan is loose because we've already got glorified bodies. So our, uh, uh, we know that the unsaved world, though, at the end of the millennium, they're going to read. There's one last rebellion against the Lord. Um, I heard Dr. Merle Unger preach a message one time, and he said that the amazing thing about that is even with a, a perfect environment that in the, in the uh, millennial kingdom, people at the end of it, unsafe, it will still rebel. Uh, there's a one final rebellion uh, instigated by Satan, or Satan is loosed after the thousand years, and Satan does what he always does. This is, I mean, this is classic. What's the first thing Satan does after he's loosed? He goes around and stirs up a bunch of people to rebel, and he, uh, Gog and Magog, that's typically been ref, uh, answered to be Russia, uh, which is very possible. Uh, the, the word Gog in the Old Testament seems to, because it, it makes reference to Meshach, which is Moscow. Um, but I think that it's more than just Russia that rebels against Christ. I, I think it's more widespread than that. So. Um, to follow up with that, will we be having in training children? Again, we won't because we're going to have glorified bodies. We, we will no longer have human bodies. There will be glorified bodies. So there will not be, uh, we won't be bearing children. Um, the unsaved people will be, as a matter of fact, the ones who end up rebelling at the end of the millennial kingdom specifically are said to be the children of the kingdom. The ch okay, so you got people that survived the tribulation, they moved into the, the millennial kingdom, and then they have children, they have children, and it, it's like the second and third generation seems to be the ones in the end that, that launched this massive revolt against uh, the Lord. At the end of the thousand year reign of Christ, when Satan is loosed, will Christians remain on earth or be back in heaven or simply be protected on earth? Um, <clears throat> right after that battle of Gog and Magog comes the new heaven and new earth. Uh, and we're going to, we'll get into this next week, what heaven's going to be like. I'm going to talk about the eternal city, the new Jerusalem, um, and so forth. Um, but re read the question again. Um, will Christians remain on earth or be back in heaven or simply be protected? Both. And I'm, I'm kind of giving away next week's uh, <laughs> lesson here. But heaven is not just up there, Okay. <clears throat> The eternal state is have a new heaven and a new earth and, and an eternal city. It's actually three things. A heaven, a new heaven, a new earth, an eternal city. And we have access to all of them. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's apparent when you read Revelation 21... Before next, before next week's lesson, read Revelation 21 and 22. And it describes the whole thing. But it talks about the gates of the city being open and people walking in and out of the gates. It appears that we have access to the new earth. And so it, it's, it's both. It's a combination of a new heaven and a new earth. Does that help? Yep. Um, and then this, this last question is from last week. What about the people who died before Jesus was crucified for our sins? What about their salvation? Uh, Old Testament people had to, they were saved on the basis of putting their faith in, the, in a future Messiah, in a coming Messiah. And that was represented by the observance of things like the animal sacrifices and so forth. They had to go to their high priest. They had to pick their little lamb once a year on Passover, go to the high priest, put their hand on the head of the little innocent lamb while its throat was cut and blood was captured and the whole scene there. 
Their salvation was a faith looking forward to, to Christ, the promise of Christ. So they were saved by faith, but that faith, since Christ had not come yet, could only that faith could only be expressed by their obedience to uh, bring the required sacrifices to God. Okay. What about the Gentiles? Gentiles in the Old Testament were saved also by faith in trusting in the God of Israel. Uh, Ruth the Moabitess was converted. She was a Moabite girl. She uh, became a convert to, to the Jewish people, to the uh, faith of, of Israel. Uh, so Gentiles um, were definitely, there's several examples in the Old Testament of Gentiles um, uh, that were saved. But they had to put themselves under the, I'd say, the umbrella of Judaism in the sense of believing in the God Jehovah of the Jewish people, okay? I mean, they couldn't keep worshiping their pagan gods. Yes. They, okay? Is that it? That's all the questions that were written. Okay. Well, if you disagree with any answers, I'll still love you no more. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, one more week. I, I want to say again how much I have appreciated. Matter of fact, it looks like we got more here tonight. This is going to be an interesting thing than when we even started two weeks ago. But uh, the crowd has not dwindled. I'll say that much. And I appreciate your faithfulness so much. You all have been a great audience, and, and I just have deeply appreciated your interest. Lord bless you. Have a good week. We'll see you uh, next Wednesday. All right, thank you guys for all being here tonight. We're going to close in a word of prayer before we leave, as all good Baptists should, right? Um, if you've enjoyed uh, this evening's uh, teaching from Pastor Richard, uh, can you let him know that by a round of applause? Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this evening, and I thank you for the opportunity to learn uh, more about you and more about what's coming in the future. And uh, God, we uh, do trust you. We do uh, put our faith and our hope in you. We look forward to that coming day when there'll be no more war, no more strife, no more worry, no more fear, no more anxiety. And uh, God, you will reign in peace and uh, with justice and truth and uh, with healing in your wings. And uh, God, we love you. Thank you for your son, Jesus. In his name we pray.